Now that's what I call a good start for the year. Amen. Give the Lord some praise. Oh, I don't ever want to put WD-40 on that. I love it. That's so much fun. Y'all are going to love me for this message. No, oh, pastor, how can you go to humor from that? Mary Hart doeth good like a medicine. So evidently you guys are going to be in good shape. Let it never be allowed at Northside, and that is a stifling of the move of the Holy Spirit. The freedom to worship Him. If you're not familiar with what's going on, the scripture basically says, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. That wasn't metaphorically speaking. That wasn't just merely philosophical phrasing. He was actually encouraging a shout unto God with a voice of triumph. As we praise God, there are some areas and ways in which we have found more liberty than others have in that there's a, a comfort to make a physical demonstration of our intentions by raising our hands and praising God. There are some odd or strange or uncomfortable but we're accustomed to that, so we don't think much of it. Though I can remember when I first started going to church as a child, I was uh, seven, almost eight years of age, and I stood in a congregation that raised their hands, and the only time I'd ever seen anybody raise their hand was if they had to go to the restroom. And I was confused why there were so many people with their hands in the air. My mother explained it to me because she had a Pentecostal background. Some people in some, some congregations, they're not comfortable with a shout to God. It's not because God's deaf. He can hear a mute person give him praise. But it is a physical demonstration of a spiritual intention in my life. God does not respond to a person kneeling more than he does to a person standing. I can show you in Scripture where God heard a person as they were laying in bed. So you can kneel, you can stand, you can sit, or you can lay down. So it's not the position that matters, but the intent behind that. Being able to hear not people giving a message in tongues, but hearing them not trying to overcome the service, not trying to draw particular attention to themselves, but simply using their prayer language to praise God. Now, in some congregations, that's not acceptable. Here at Northside, we enjoy the fullness of the gospel and the demonstration of that gospel. And I love the fact that, well, I'll tell you, put it this way. Right in the middle of the worship service, I know she didn't hear me because she was busy praying, was the church is singing. Now that may sound strange halfway through the service, but somewhere along the line we went from singing songs to the church singing. And there was a sense to it, a, an atmosphere about it, where an unbeliever could walk into the congregation and go, I'm not used to this, but this is good. Where, where a Christian who is not raised in the midst of a quote-unquote Pentecostal church would find it a little bit off-putting, a little strange, and yet a sense of the, the presence of God that makes it more acceptable. It's kind of like, like eating someone's food and you've never sat under their cooking before and you see them put something in the food that you've never seen done before and your first thought is, I don't know about that. But then when you eat it, you're going, we need to put that in our recipe. We need to keep this in our recipe. Giving praise to God, an expression, physical demonstration of our spiritual intentions. That's why you'll see individuals 
And it's becoming more comfortable within our congregation, not coming down to be prayed for, but just to make a physical demonstration of their intention of coming down and kneeling in the congregation, not so everybody goes, oh, but instead just they're honoring God, and that's an effort and an intention, and that's the cry of their heart. Because not everybody who comes down to an altar is looking for someone to pray for them. They're just coming down there to honor God in a particular way. That's why you'll see individuals walk down to the middle of the congregation while we're singing and stand there and raise, praise God. He said, well, they must have a desperate need that they're trying to draw attention. No, they've got a desperate need to honor God. And so they don't care what the rest of the church is doing. They, they make a physical effort to demonstrate their spiritual intention and begin to praise God. In fact, we've, we've kind of tried teaching a little bit about the fact that if you want prayer, come to the altar. If you just want to come down to pray, kneel back. You know, take a step or two back. That way you're in the, you're in the I'm praying to y'all come pray for me department. That makes sense? And that way, there's, you know, you don't have to go, hey, someone, come here, pray. You know, you just know if I come down here, somebody's going to slip out. And you may notice here at Northside, the pastor and his wife don't, aren't the first ones to come pray for people. Do you know why? This is our church, not hers and mine. This is where we minister. This is where the body ministers to the body, that we care for each other. It is something that huge churches do not have, dare not have, because then wildfire and weird fire comes into their church. Strangers come down to their altars, and then you got a problem. But we are of a size where we know who is who. And if a total stranger comes down, you don't worry about it. If a total stranger comes down to an altar to come pray for you, trust me, you will hear the voice of your pastor real quick because I believe in protecting those who God has given me care of. You with me on this? This has got nothing to do with losing weight. We're going to get into that bitter subject in a minute. This is teaching time so that we might be a Pentecostal church, not of a bunch of Fruit Loops, and weirdos, but intentional Pentecostals allowing the move of the Holy Spirit to allow the opportunity to say, well, I, 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 what, did I see someone go right off through the whole congregation praising God? You better believe it. Amen. And if you'll notice, it didn't put a damper on the service. It caught a few attentions. It was kind of like, but it didn't take away. Why? Because of the intent and purpose, a physical demonstration of a spiritual intent before God. To me, it's always recollected back to the old Jericho march. Because on the last march, it says, and when you march around the seventh time, whisper. No, it said, shout unto God. I love being Pentecostal. I do not want to be assembly of God. I want to be Pentecostal. Because I can guarantee you can go to some Assembly of God churches, they will not allow this. That is sad. Because this is who we are. We are Pentecostals, not out of honoriness, uh, stubbornness, or, or personality attitude. It is because this is what God did on the day of Pentecost, and it is still as real now as it's ever been. But the bottom line is when you, come on, give God praise. I don't mind. The bottom line is when you walk out, you walk out better than you walked in. That means when I raise my hand and give God praise, I better reach out my hand in ministry for God. I better live the life out there that I've done in here. The old Pentecostals used to use it this way. You got to jump right, land right, and spit white. That was when they had a whole lot of chaw and tobaccos, and so they just really were against it, so they came up with that phrase of, you know, you can jump and shout, but when you get outside, you ought to still have a mouth that gives glory to God. I'm not going to argue over whether what tobacco does whatever. That's just between you and God. Uh, it, it, we, ha we do have a restriction within our church because if you're leading, we do ask a special effort in leadership. You know, they say, well, that's kind of harsh. No, it's just we're trying. We're trying to set the best example we can before our children, your children, my children, their children, anybody else's child who walks in here. Whew. Okay, now, <clears throat> that had absolutely, positively nothing 
to do with the message. But it was good. <laughs> I love it. Time to lose weight. I was so tempted to get somebody on the scales. But I thought better of it. <laughs> Remind me to tell you of a conversation I had this morning. <laughs> uh. Let me explain what I mean by weight. Now, I'm going to get some of the particulars on these details a little bit messed up, but I'm, I'm going to still try all the same. Have you ever heard the expression, white elephant? It dates back to the king of Siam. The story goes that this was his way of getting vengeance on his enemies that were in places of power and authority. He would go and give them a royal gift of a white elephant. You go, what's so bad about that? They were not allowed to use it for commercial gain. They were not allowed to use it in any form of labor. It had a particular diet that it had to be fed. And harm coming to it would be a slight to the king. So this... this individual that was a pain in his backside now is pouring his resources, his attention, and his efforts into keeping that big, dumb, stupid animal alive and healthy so he couldn't occupy himself otherwise. It was a white elephant. It was dead weight. In Hebrews, the 12th chapter, the scripture speaks of laying aside the weight and sin that easily besets us. One of the challenges we get into as Christians is we try to find out what is sin and what isn't so that if it isn't, we can do it. And if it's in the gray area, it's up for debate. But the Bible speaks of weights as being encumbering as much as sin itself. That means that the enemy doesn't have to get you to enter into clear, defined, sinful actions to slow you down, to hinder your walk and possibly lead you from the proper path. He can also encumber you with a white elephant to bring something into your life. Husband, wife, mom, dad, son, daughter, brother, sister, uncle, aunt, or total stranger. Something into your life that occupies you so much that you don't have the time, the finances, the energy, desire, or inclination to be involved. So that weight of, you say, well, that's not a sin, but the problem is weight will eventually lead you to sin. Because eventually you'll find those weights keeping you from doing what God wants you to do. And when you don't do what God wants you to do, you're doing against the will of God, and there's a definition of sin. So back, Hebrews 12.1. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, you see, that greater cloud of witnesses was found in Hebrews 11. We speak of them as, as stories almost, but these were events. People's lives took place. And, and I just took the time and I, I went through Hebrews 11. 
and breaking it down according to what the Word says instead of reading all of it, I want you to hear the type of witnesses, the type of crowd you're supposed to be hanging around. It says witnesses that we are surrounded by, we are encompassed about by, that as sons and daughters of God we are judged by. And this starts off with those that died in faith and they never saw the finished product of God's promise. Now we would consider them a failure. What, they started off but they never finished. Oh, they finished, but the project, the plan, the purpose that God had in store was not going to be accomplished in their lifetime, but they were faithful to the promise. People like Abel, who gave sacrificially. Enoch, who walked with God. This is the brag. He walked with God. It says it twice, at least, that he walked with God. And then later on it says, and he walked with God and he was not. I love the phrase that someone used so many years ago, and I've used it ever since. You just know how it must have happened that he was walking with God, and God said, I oh, want you come home with me. We're closer there than home, your place, and just went on. That's walking with God, where you're in the presence of God, not just, oh, now the service is good, and enjoying the presence of God is great, and the move of God, but I'm telling you, you can take that out of this church. You can enjoy praise and worship of God. It doesn't always have to be loud or noisy. It doesn't always have to be quiet and still. But you can take that outside the church. You can live that life of walking with God. You don't visit him. Another phrase I've used. God doesn't want a date. He wants a marriage. Sunday morning's a great date. He wants a marriage. Walked with God. Noah trusted God. Abraham looked for the city built by God. Sarah conceived depending upon God. Then it went on to those that demonstrated faith by actions. Abraham tested concerning the very life of his son. Isaac blessed his sons with the promise he had yet to see himself. Jacob blesses his son in faith of what the future would hold. Joseph on his deathbed still held to that promise. Three generations of dad to son to son to son blessing them with the promise of God that they had yet not seen completed. That is how you men should be with your sons. I don't care if they can hunt. I don't care if they can fish. I don't care if your son and your daughter can do whatever the world finds as an accomplishment or a great entertainment. If you don't lead them, what was it? Gail Gunther. I was reading about her son when he was nine years old. They went fishing. Or no, honey. They went hunting together. Didn't see anything. But while they were out, she talked to him about the Lord. And while hunting, led him to salvation. Now that's something to bring your kids. That's being passing on the faith. You can't pass on your salvation. You can pass on the truth of your faith. From birth, Moses was the epicenter of faith. His mother hid him, trusting God. Moses rejected earthly riches for God's riches. He rejected worldly rule for the rule of God. He initiated the Passover, confident of God's power. He led Israel on dry ground through the Red Sea, through faith. When he started the Passover, he had never heard of the Passover. It hadn't been named yet. Nothing had passed over yet. Do you know what passed over? The death angel. God said, I'm going to send a death angel. What's a death angel? We've never dealt with a death angel. There's nothing in the books about a death angel. What do you mean death angel? He didn't have a problem. God said, I'm sending a death angel. Works for me. I'll do what, what do I need to do. And he gave them the concept of the Passover lamb and how they were supposed to pick it out, what qualities it was supposed to be. If you want to read about Jesus in the Old Testament, read the Passover lamb. And he set him aside, and then they sacrificed, and the blood was placed on the post of the door, and, and everybody that was in the house, just because your mom and dad served God, just because your mom and dad put blood on the lentils, did not protect you unless you were under the blood yourself. I've always suspected that there was some Israelite boy, teenager, 
who had his eye on a young Egyptian girl. And mom and dad were so busy with the Passover that he just kind of slipped out the back window to have one more date when the Passover, land, Passover took place, when the death angel passed over. And because he wasn't under the blood, he died. Well, his mom and dad were good godly people. I'm glad. He's got a generational spread of good godly people. That's good. But he had to have a personal obedience to God's word for him to be safe. These are the witnesses that we have. This is who we're surrounded by. Then it goes on and says that these are the ones that just overcame through faith. Jericho's wall fell out of obedience of faith. How appropriate today. Rahab the harlot became an ancestor of Jesus through faith. Don't tell me you're not good enough to be a child of God when God took a prostitute and made her his great grand, his, his son's great grandmother. God picked her out, had it planned out so a prostitute could be the great grandmother of Jesus Christ. God is not a respecter of persons. Sin is sin in his eyes. Submit and surrender and you're in the same wonderful position as anybody else because there's level ground at the foot of the cross. Oh, no, I get a little closer. My mama was a Christian. My, my grandmother was a Christian. My grandmother's mother was a Christian. God's not impressed by any of the genealogy. All he wants to do is know this one thing. Do you know my son as your savior? We already checked out your mom. She made it. Now, where are you? Gideon, Barak, Samson. Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets subdued kingdoms. David and Samuel, prophets, individuals. We say prophets and we lose them in some sort of a unique position, but all they were were men that served God according to what God laid on their lives. It goes on and speaks of others that dealt with lions, fire, sword, armies, conflicts, weaknesses, and they did it triumphantly. Unnamed hosts saw dead raised, tortured, refusing deliverance in faith. Others stoned, sawn in two, placed temptation, slain, lived in poverty, affliction, torment, homeless, living in caves and hollowed out holes in the ground. When it says dens, it's not talking about the den in your house. It's talking about where the fox dug a hole in the ground and you kicked him out. And now you're living in his hole in the ground. Oh, God doesn't love me. I don't have a Cadillac. Oh, God doesn't love me because things are bad in my life. We are surrounded by men and women who laid aside the weights and sins. Didn't say they didn't have weights in their life, didn't have sins. It says to lay aside the weights and sins. Why? Because you're surrounded by so many people who live the life, walk the walk, as well as talk the talk. We need to set some weight aside this year. We, as individuals, need to stop and look at our lives and go, okay, what is occupying my time so much that every time God pushes me to do something, I, can't, I just don't, I'll do it next week. I can't do it right now. I can't go talk to them. I can't do that. I can't be a part of that. I can't minister in that area. So oh, you're just trying to get church workers. No, I'm trying to get you to talk to your fellow workers. But we get weights in our lives that cause us to not accomplish what God wants. We become encumbered. How many have ever had a foot race with other people? Literally, on your feet, racing. Okay. How many have had an impromptu foot race? In other words, it wasn't planned. It was just like, hey, you want to run? Hey, yeah, okay. Well, I think I'm faster. I'm faster than you. Okay. What did you do? 
Did you go out and pick up a watermelon and say, okay, let's go? Did you pick up a log from the fireplace and say, okay, let's run? You removed everything possible. I can remember one very clearly. I will not name the names of the individuals that were running. This was a few years ago. I will tell you that right now. I had knees back then that were very friendly. And I can remember the, the guy who was at that time the worship leader of this church. And for some reason, just because he was athletic when he was, you know, in, in college and all, he just thought me being a dumb old preacher, I wasn't healthy or not. And we made some comment about health and speed. And I go, yeah, I'm, I was pretty fast when I was in high school. Oh, preach, you couldn't do anything. I said, come on, let's do it. First thing I did was get rid of them big, ugly shoes I was wearing because I knew I'd never get anywhere slip sliding around. I took my wallet and my keys out of my pocket. Not that they weigh that much, still don't. But I was getting rid of everything I could that could possibly slow me down. Because I figured I had a race on my hand. And so they were there, get ready, get set. There was three of us. Go! The first guy quit about 10 steps. I'm running and I'm realizing I'm all by myself. So I turn around and look, and speedy ain't so much. So I'm running this way now. Come on, come on, you can do it. Those were the days. But the point is, is every one of you that ran that race did not go pick up more weight. In fact, you checked to see what you could get rid of, what would encumber you, what would slow you down, what would cause you not to win they tell me that swimmers, speed swimmers, shave their head, mainly the men, shave their head because that water might find resistance in their hair. Now, they, they shave their legs. I'm going, if the hair on my legs is going to slow me down enough to not win the race, odds are I'm not going to win the race anyway. But you see what I'm saying? It's amazing what people will do for just a temporary prize of victory. And God has challenged us here with these, this chapter 11 of all these people and says, encompassed about by this crowd of witnesses, let us lay aside the weights of this present world. You see, you've got to find out what... What are, you, what are you about? Are you really in this race to win it? They've got this phrase I hear over and over again during football season. We're in it to win it. And I'm thinking, that's stupid. No, we're in it to lose it. it uh, you know, of course you're in it to win it. But at the same time, what's your commitment? What's it all about? I watch some football players. I like watching football. I don't understand all of it, but I like watching it. It gets me when I see a guy running and somebody's come at him and he just gets off the sideline real quick. It's kind of like, no, dude, every yard counts. But he's not running just to win the game. He's running to keep money in his pocket, and he knows if they hit him hard enough the wrong time, he's out for life. So they have a tendency sometimes to slip to the side. There's a story told of old Bear Bryant. Said that they were playing against a, another team, fourth quarter, two minutes to go. They pretty well got it. So Bear Bryant sent in the fourth string quarterback just to give him some experience. And he said, now, son, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go in there and run the ball down the middle. Then run the ball down the middle. Then run the ball down the middle. And then punt. The game's ours. Young man, yes, sir, ran out there, ran the ball, first down. Wow. Ran the ball again, first down. Wow. He's getting excited. Ran the ball again, first down. He forgets what Bear Bryant said and decides he's going to pass for a touchdown. He gets back there, throws it, safety takes the interception. Safety strips past everybody. And here's this lanky old fourth-string quarterback gets his rear into gear, starts moving, and he runs for all he's worth and knocks the man down, and boom, the gun goes off. The, winning, the losing coach came over to talk to Bear Bryant, and he said, man, good game. 
He says, but I'm telling you, I just do not understand how your fourth string quarterback caught the fastest safety on my team. Bear Bryant told me, he says, well, that's kind of easy. He says, see, your man was running for a touchdown. Mine was running for his life. <laughs> it pays to have motivation. I'm running for my life. How about you? Amen. And I'm going to, I'm going to do everything I can. Now, I don't know about you, but I pick up weights real easy. And the longer I serve God, the easier it is to, to suddenly discover I've got weights. When I was a kid and we'd just, we'd just be out back, out in the back pasture, and, and by the time we got back, do you know what was clinging to our pants? We called them cockleburrs. Man, they just, I mean, and, and, and you didn't pick them up yourself. They just simply seemed to come out of nowhere and clamp on. Well, I'm telling you this year, I promise you, you got cockleburrs coming in your life. Some of you've already got a cockleburr or two. And some of you are more like that pet dog of yours. Because you've had that cockleburr so long, all you got is a big old wadded knot that you don't know how to get rid of. Come on, this is kind of homey, but it fits. I'm telling you right now, it's better to lose a little hair than to keep that weight in your life. It's better to lose a little skin. It's better to lose a little bit of financial involvement. It's better to lose a couple of friends because I'm telling you when you stand before God, your friends that you allow to mess up your life are not going to be standing there advocating in your behalf. It's going to be between you and God and he's either going to say, well done, or what were you thinking? And he already knows the answer to that too. Time to lose some weight, huh? Finally, it says in that latter part, go back to 12.1 if you would. Let's go back to Hebrews 12.1. Look at this last part. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You see, the second verse says, looking to the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ. See, we've got a goal, a purpose in life here. And it's not about money, it's not about finances, it's not about friends, it's not about being accepted by those around you, it is that you are running for Christ. You are doing everything you can for Christ. The story's told about a dad who, he was a pastor and, 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 and he brought his child in for a, 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 to have some, a blood test and the little kid just freaking out, just couldn't handle it, couldn't handle it. And the dad it was a close friend of his that was doing the thing, and he said, I know this is against practice. He said, but do me a favor, just close the door and take a sample of my blood first and let my son watch. And the little boy sat there and watched Dad not flinch or anything and donate a little bit of blood. And he says, now, you watch Daddy. Can you do it? Yes, sir, I can do it. When you say you can't do it, it's because you just don't have your eyes on your father. When you say you can't do it, it's because you got your eyes off of Christ who did so much already for you. Don't tell me you can't do it if he can die for you. Don't tell me you can't do it if he surrender all of heaven for you. Don't tell me you can't do it after he accepted your sins on his life, his very spirit. His, he was stained with your sins. Don't tell me you can't do it. I can do all things through Christ. Why? Because he's already done everything that needed doing. I'm not telling you you won't pick up the cockleburrs. I'm not telling you that, that by, by making this determination, and this is, this is such a weight loss sermon. 
Because I can stand up here and talk about, about diets and health and actions, and you can all say, yeah, yeah, you're right. I need to lose a couple of pounds. Yeah, I need to. But you can agree with me all day. But until you walk out of here and apply it, all the praying, all the agreeing, all the tears in the world won't change it. You can tell him all day long at this altar, God, I will, I will, I will. And then the next thing you know, you don't, you don't, you don't. It's what you do out there that matters as much as what you do in here. Right now, if you're really curious, drive by the gyms this time of year. They will be chock full of cars. Give it six months and drive by the exact same day and time. See, they already got what they wanted, your membership fee. They don't really care if you show back up again. You can have all the determination you want, but I'll tell you right now, you're not going to lose weight. We're back to spiritual. You're not going to lose weight unless you do it through Christ. You can, you can, you, God can reveal it to you right now, things that are hindering your Christian walk, things that are just slowing you down from accomplishing, the, uh, to, to earn your right to walk in that crowd. But it's going to take Christ in you. Not a prayer at an altar, but a walk with God is what you desperately need. Not a historical moment in your life where you bowed your knee and accepted Christ, but a day-to-day -day personal commitment to serving God. Here's a question. You're going to hate me for it. How many have ever started a read through the Bible in a year? Anybody? How many finished it? Oh boy, man, I'd say two-thirds of you dropped your hand. Good intentions will not work, folks. It takes God to do anything in your spiritual walk. You can be the most stubborn person in this church, which you can't be because I am. All, all my deacons? Okay. But I am an easygoing, compliant pastor, too. I heard, it got so quiet, I could actually hear the ding of somebody's phone. <laughs> it got too quiet. <laughs> ding. <laughs> now that rings a bell. Yeah. I'm going to end this message with this. I got caught up in this runner concept. I, I used to run. I loved to run. I, I wasn't the fastest guy on the, uh, in, in the school, but I was, you know, like the second fastest. I, man, I was just, I loved it. And, and I used it to my advantage in sports, and, and it was all great, you know, and that was decades and decades and decades and decades <laughs> and a half ago when I did all that. And I am not what I once was. Sister Donna was so nice, she just goes, mm -hmm. <laughs> she knows for a fact that's the truth. But I love this running concept. Listen to this. This is advice that runners give runners. This is advice. Not, this has got nothing Christian, just advice to runners. And all I've, well, you listen to it. Run every day. If you're going to be a runner, run every day. This is their advice. My advice, if you're going to run this race as a Christian, don't do it Sundays. Do it every day. Do it at work. Yeah, I know it's easy to hang out and slide a little bit, but no, you run every day. Give yourself a reason to run. If your only purpose in life is heaven, then you don't have a reason to be here on earth. I still have a reason for being here on earth. I still have opportunity of talking to people outside this church. Yes, I'm a pastor, but you know I'm a Christian a lot longer than I've been a pastor. And as a Christian, I witness to people, not because of skills and ability, but because that is what God wants every one of us to do. So I have a reason to run. 
Oh, that I might see him, absolutely, but others might see him with me. Stay positive. Hey, some of you guys, let me say that again. Because y'all can get so negative sometimes. Some of you guys, I'm not looking at anybody in particular. I'm staring at the ceiling. Whatever. But I'm just telling you, stay positive. Negative Christians don't make sense. Oh, life's terrible. I thought you were a Christian. I am, and life's terrible. Oh, God's taking good care of you, huh? Stay positive. I'm going to see it somehow. It's going to work. How many went through troubles last year? How many survived? Oh, come on, that one should have been a 100%. Some of you are going, well, I don't know. You're here, aren't you? Find your sweet spot. Your speed, your, 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 your stride. Find where you belong in the body of Christ. Do something. Yeah. I don't care if you're a spring. <laughs> Just do something this year. I don't care if you do fish water. I came to one of the men of the church and I said, hey, do me a favor. You do electrical. Could you fix the light outside? Yeah, I'll take care of that. Do something. Everybody doesn't have to preach. And we sure don't need anybody who preaches longer than me. We, we don't need everybody who can sing. I, I took 15 minutes. That doesn't count. The first 15, 15 minutes off. The first. She keeps track of how long I preach. But find your sweet spot. Find your purpose in life as a Christian. Your purpose in life is not to earn income, build a house, collect money. Your purpose in life is in some form or fashion bring an increase in glory to God. Put off partying. Hey, this is what they tell runners. Put off partying. You can take that anywhere you want. Forget the speedsters. You run your own race. God didn't call you to run their race. There are going to be those who are just, I mean, speeders, 100 meters, and they're gone. God didn't call you to be a speeder. You may be a marathon runner. You may just be part of the relay. That's how I see myself as a pastor. I'm just part of the relay team. The baton was passed to me as a pastor, and someday, many, many years from now, I'll pass that baton on to someone else. I'm a relay runner. God didn't call me to be a speedster. Train smart. Start, stop, start, stop. That's not smart. Stay after it. Be a social runner. Run with somebody. Find a partner that will run with you. Not, well, my wife's my partner. Is she running with you? Because your, your wife should be in some form or a fashion your running partner. But you need to find men and women, young people in the church that are your runners, your social runners, interaction. They say a guy can run more, a woman can run more when they've got a runner to run with than by themselves. If they can be a social runner, it's so much easier. There's that, that commitment to each other. Talk to others about running. Don't just be a Christian. Talk to others about Christianity. Not Northside Introduce them, Northside's a great place to come. Thank you. I don't know who said that, but I sure appreciated that. Y'all are getting quiet at the wrong times. I was afraid I was going to hear the ding of the phone again. Talk to others about Christ. And then, back to my first one. Just do it. Do something for God. Galatians asked this question I don't ever want spoken to me. You ran well. Who hindered you? from obeying the truth. See, it's not who starts the race. It's not the guy who has the flair of the race. It's the one who finished the race. It's time to lose some weight. It's time to look for the cockleburrs. It's time to find out what did you pick up over the last year or two or three in attitude, activity, interests, focus, that is taking up so much of your time that you find yourself way too busy to be responsive to the directions of God. Somebody says, well, you know, I, I, God hasn't told me to do anything. It may be because you're nowhere near where he is to hear that conversation. 
You can say, oh, me on that one. Aren't you glad you made it to church? Don't you wish you'd have left right after the worship service? Let's stand. I'm warning you in this year to come, we're going to have a, a few more moments available in altar service, but not, not this morning. Because what I've talked about cannot be accomplished at this altar. You cannot make up your mind and determine today. Because if, 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 if there's some of us here that if we had a two before, for every time we came to pray, we could build another house. For every time we came and made promises to God, we could build a real house, some of us. Oh, God, I will. Oh, God, I will. Oh, God, I will. And there's another two before. To, you know, no. I need you to not promise God. I need you to do it with God. I need you to look at the crowd of witnesses that surrounds you, of men and women that just did it. And then make up your mind, not because life's going to be easy, it wasn't easy for them. Not because they were uh, celebrated and received, they weren't. Not because they were following in the footsteps of others, they didn't all. Some of them were pilgrims and trying a whole new something. But the one thing they did was they walked in faith, not in sight. It's time to lose weight. It's time to find out what that weight is. Because you can walk out of here going, oh, that was a good sermon. I was, okay, I need to lose weight. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. You know, and walk out. Or you can take the time to shut up, sit down, and listen to God. And he'll talk to you about what's the cockle burrs that you've picked up that are hindering your life. How many agree we need to lose weight? Amen. Amen. Give God praise. We're not going to sing this song as a congregation, but I love that song. Miracle worker, promise keeper, way maker. That is who he is. In 2021, Let's lose weight and let's be profitable to God. I don't care if you're the star. I don't care if you're getting trophies by other people. All I care about is that you have the assurance that God is saying, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Are we in agreement? Amen. Father, right now with our heads bowed and our hearts, closed, hearts just bowed before you, Lord, I'm asking, speak to them right now, individually and collectively. Lord, the men, the women, the young people standing here today, from the most spiritual to the most, most novice of all, speak to their hearts of the weights not the condemnations of the world, not the opinions of man, but things that you speak to that man and that woman, that son, that daughter, you speak to them and you tell them, this, this I need you to lose so that I can make better use of you. Father, help us. Help me because I can't lose weight without you. I just won't accomplish the job. Father, use us wherever we walk, whatever we deal with, whether housewife or, or executive in, in a building. Father, whether a man on his tools or, or leadership of the same. Father, whether we're, we're white collar, blue collar, does not matter. Father, what matters now is that we, in 2021, are about our Father's business. Lord, bring increase, we ask, not of our finances, increase to the kingdom of God in this church. Lord, that more souls be saved, that people begin to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Those that have received the baptism, that they begin to seek the power that comes with that baptism 
so that we might impact the lives of the souls around us, our neighbors, our schoolmates, our friends, Father, the stranger in the store. Use us. Don't just protect us. I don't want to be a china bowl, Father. I want to be a service to you. Bless now, Father, I ask, and help us to lose weight in Jesus' name. If you're in agreement, say amen.